Thanks for tuning in to FemPower Health. I just wanted to acknowledge that FemPower Health has a new look and with that, a new website. But as you may uh, tell from my scratchy voice, I sadly have COVID and we've run into a couple of technical glitches. So I'm going to hold off on my formal announcement that gives more details and I'll be recording that as a special episode coming soon, I'm hoping within the next week. So I just wanted to at least acknowledge that everything looks different, but a lot of great things are coming your way to help you have a much more customized experience with the content that you really want to hear. So thank you again for your support. Enjoy this episode and keep coming back. Hi, Georgie here with the Fem Power Health Podcast, and welcome to the first episode of season two, where I interview Denise of Thyroid Change. And January is Thyroid Awareness Month, so I thought this was the perfect topic, especially since I see so many women talking about misdiagnosis and delayed diagnosis when it comes to thyroid conditions. So I wanted to go to someone who's dealt with thyroid conditions herself and is an advocate for those who are struggling to get diagnosed and properly treated. So take a listen. So tell us about yourself and your organization. Uh, okay, well, um, I'm Denise Rogas, and I'm one of the co-founders of Thyroid Change. And Thyroid Change is a um, thyroid health information website. It started uh, not with a website, but with a, uh, a mission, I guess, and, or, or a drive to want to do something about the current state of thyroid health care. I met up with another woman named Michelle Campo who's now Michelle Santanastasso, and we were two struggling thyroid patients, and we met through social media channels, through a thyroid Facebook group, a health group, and we were both struggling, uh, going in circles with our health. So it started with us getting together, creating a petition, and um, trying to gather um, like-minded people, practitioners, practitioners, other patient advocates together to create something that can help unite us for change because there's a, um, there is a, a lack of adequate thyroid health care out there. And a part of why I wanted to talk to you today is based on a lot of the things I'm seeing in social media where it almost seems like with thyroid disease, there's just not adequate health care. And I'm sure that it's much, much more complex But the reason why I wanted to connect with you is because you have so much knowledge about the thyroid disease. And I find that when I talk to advocacy groups, you tend to have a much broader viewpoint because you're interacting with so many patients and have that firsthand knowledge of some of the challenges that they face. And one of the things I'm noticing is it seems as though the challenges fall into two buckets. So there's the diagnosis, But then once someone's diagnosed, they may get really, really excited, but then there's issues with the treatment. So maybe we can talk about the first part, which is the diagnosis. And obviously we'll conclude today with some of the solutions for those who are struggling. But I do want to start talking about the diagnosis and why it is so hard to know that you have a thyroid condition. Part of it is the the symptoms overlap maybe with other conditions as well too. So maybe we should start with a little bit of the symptoms where yes. uh, a lot of the common symptoms include depression, anxiety, fatigue, unexplained fatigue, muscle pain. Thyroid hormone is needed with every in every cell of the body. So really there's hundreds and thousands of symptoms that could happen. But with the hypothyroid condition, the most common are the fatigue, muscle pain, uh, depression, cognitive issues, brain fog. So I think with a weight gain, and so I, I think these symptoms can be sometimes vague for some people and they can be debilitating for others. And I think there's a lot of overlap, you know, with other conditions out there and they might be dismissed um, or, oh, you might be tired just now or under a lot of stress, you're getting older, um, that type of thing. So I think maybe one, um, some practitioners aren't quite listening to the the full myriad of symptoms and maybe the patient isn't expressing um, themselves fully too. The other part that we see with it is um, 
they go to their doctor explaining these symptoms, describing them, some of these symptoms, and um, the testing is, is flawed, um, or the, the standard, I would say the standard test is flawed. It has come to our knowledge, too, that a lot of doctors will only test TSH, the thyroid-stimulating hormone. And that is really a measure, measure of what is happening with the pituitary gland, that signal between the brain and the thyroid. It's measuring that signal, not what is actually uh, available to the cells and what is going on in the cells. So if they're relying only on that one, one test, that's only one piece of the, the thyroid puzzle. And there are other tests that um, doctors should be looking at. That makes a lot of sense. And I know that when we were discussing what to cover in today's podcast, I myself was a bit challenged because it is my mission to educate people about how to advocate for their health. And if we were to title this podcast, Advocating for Your Thyroid, that assumes we're at a starting point where the patient already knows that they have a thyroid issue. But as you, you know, started out saying, the patient actually begins with, symptoms. You know, I'm tired, I'm overweight, I have headaches. And then they go to their doctor. And if they're not in a position of grinning and bearing it, they do visit that doctor. And, you know, if they have the right information, they may, you know, advocate and ask specific questions. But in a lot of cases, people don't know this or the doctor isn't hearing them properly for whatever reason. And it's not as though we're going to order thousands of dollars of tests for every possible condition. So how can a consumer or a patient advocate for themselves so that they get the proper diagnosis as fast as possible? Good question. I would say just in my own experience, my own family experience too, and patients I've known, even just suffering with d depression, um, they're complaining of that one symptom. Um, depression alone should be a screening for a thyroid condition too. So that was the case with my sister. She was um, dealing with some depression, anxiety type of issues. And thankfully her psychiatrist was savvy enough and realized that, okay, this could be a possible thyroid condition. And sure enough, it was. So, I mean, as far as advocating for oneself, right? I mean, our, our mission is to educate and to inform the public of um, what the signs of a thyroid condition could be. If they, if they have that background knowledge of like, okay, this could maybe possibly be a thyroid condition. I, I would just say, you know, going to their doctor mention it to their doctor. I, I think perhaps this could be a thyroid condition because I have these symptoms. Uh, I know that thyroid can present itself in all type of situations. It doesn't, you don't have to have all nine symptoms. It can present itself with just one or two symptoms and it can vary in degrees. And I would recommend that they ask their doctor to run a full thyroid plan panel, including reverse T3, which includes TSH, free T3, free T4, reverse T3, and thyroid antibodies. And they could go even a little bit further with total T3 and T4. Those would be the main things. But the other problem lies in practitioners may not be savvy in interpreting those labs. So the lab ranges are very broad. So maybe we'll talk about that in a, another topic. <laughs> so it's not just the, you know, getting tests run, it's finding the pr practitioner who is able to interpret those labs. So I'd actually like to talk about both. So I'll give you an example um, of a personal situation. So because of all the podcasts I've been doing, I've learned so much about you know, the cross-functional team that you need. And I have a, luckily a trusted source of cross-functional experts that I work with even personally. And you know, one of the things that I keep hearing from them over and over again is about getting a full thyroid panel. So I went to my OBGYN and given the situation I was in, um, my team had requested that I get a full thyroid panel so that they can evaluate. And I had asked her to do it and she insisted on only doing the TSH. And I know that the industry disagrees on what the normal TSH level is. And so I had asked her, okay, if my, you know, what level do you use? as the correct range. And she said, well, it depends on the lab. And I said, well, okay, does the lab tell you what is going on based on the way they evaluate it? And she just seemed to be very much check the box, like whatever the lab says. And 
I insisted on doing the full thyroid panel. And what she explained to me was, well, that's what endocrinologists do. So I said, hold on a minute. You're very capable of ordering this test. It has been requested and you're going to make me do two doctor visits um, potentially, but we don't even know if the TSH is even going to be enough because we're not aligned on what you're finding as the correct metric. Um, and so I was really frustrated about this and I honestly felt like I was being a bad, mean patient, but in fact, I was advocating for myself and it was just such a tough place to be. And, you know, I'd love to talk to you more about that and get your thoughts. To be honest, it's, a, it's old school. The, the reliance of the TSH test is, is a bit old school and the guidelines haven't caught up with it yet. Um, and I, I remember Dr. Holtorf telling, um, he's a thyroid specialist and, and hormone specialist in California. I remember him saying that he feels that the research and, and the guidelines are about 17 years behind <laughs> wow. uh, statistically, um, even with other conditions and issues. But yeah, similar story with me too. Um, for about 17 years, I was struggling with um, a lot of troubling symptoms. Um, fatigue, depression, anxiety, um, freezing cold all the time. Um, I didn't really have weight gain though, um, but thyroid disease runs in my family. All the women on my mother's side have a thyroid condition, all of them. And I would explain this to my doctor. I didn't really know much about the thyroid labs, what I should order then. I just knew family history, you know, there's a thyroid condition in my family. Right. Um, and I had these symptoms, you know, when I looked it up on my own way back when, and it seemed to sort of correlate. I didn't have all the symptoms, but some of them. Um, and you know what? Two doctors told me over the 17 year time span, they said, um, uh, well, you don't have weight gain. You're not overweight. So you, I don't think you could have a thyroid condition. <laughs> So, and then they were only testing TSH. And so it took about 17 years to find a practitioner and it was someone who was considered like an in integrative doctor focusing on hormone health. Um, and based on my symptoms and everything I was uh, describing to him, he said, well, I don't even think I need to test your thyroid at all, the full panel, because I know you have a thyroid condition just based on like you're freezing cold all the time. Your appendages are cold. Your nose is cold. Everything's cold, but, and your temperature's low, but we'll, we'll test it. And sure enough, free T3 was rock bottom. Free T4 was rock bottom. And if anyone's interested in listening to a doctor's perspective on the challenges with TSH and understanding what should be measured and how. Dr. Laura Shaheen, she is an expert on recurrent pregnancy loss and recently wrote a book called Not Broken. She's a reproductive endocrinologist and obviously looks at um, many different types of blood levels. And uh, she does talk about the complexities with TSH. So it's a really great perspective if anyone wants to take a listen. And in this podcast, uh, what I've been doing also, it's uh, interviewing a lot of functional medicine doctors. I myself have worked with a lot of acupuncturists. I've had a functional medicine doctor before. And what I'm seeing uh, through all of these discussions is a much more multifunctional, cross-functional approach. Even large academic medical centers around the country are looking at more patient-centric medicine where you do have these cross-functional teams. And what really struck me is when I read a book called he How Healing Works by Dr. Wayne Jonas. And he used to be, um, he was actually trained as an allopathic doctor and then moved into functional medicine. And one of the things he said is allopathic medicine is great for acute care, but once you get into chronic conditions, you really need that broader team helping you because it's just a lot harder to treat and there's a lot more complexity um, in supporting these people. So let's get back to these blood results. You mentioned that interpretation is another challenge. Now, I know that we're not going to get into some detailed medical lesson on how to read lab results, but maybe you can at a high level just provide some guidance on how we know if our clinician is properly even reading the information that's being provided by the lab. That is a great question. And I think we're taught to trust our doctors, right, all the time. Um, and I just want to point out, I am not a doctor, um, but what I, what I aim to do with thyroid change is take the information that I have found from, um, you know, pioneers in the, the thyroid health industry to take their information and relay it to the public. That's okay. my goal. 
our thyroid gurus out there are telling us that, right, TSH is not the only test. It, it's one piece to the puzzle of maybe how or why your thyroid is working, um, but it's not the only one. So the question is, how do I know if my doctor is interpreting the labs? I would say some clues, if your doctor may not be savvy, is questioning, um, well, we don't need to run that. Um, or, well, the lab range says this, you know, focusing solely, having their nose right into the lab weight range without like listening to your symptoms and being like, and, or understanding that, you know, not everyone falls within the lab range. We also know too that those lab ranges are very broad. <sighs> It's difficult for a patient to start questioning their doctor, right? Yeah, because you get into this territory of, well, I'm the doctor, I know better, there's an ego there, you're just the patient, you might be accused of Googling too much or finding things on the internet, so what do you do? Um, I guess if you suspect a thyroid issue, you know, go to Thyroid Change, go to some other websites um, of integrative doctors too that are describing what it means to be in the top range of, of the, the free T3 or be in the top third of free T4. There's information out there. As far as interpreting the labs, I always recommend to patients, the patients that we hear that are having the best results are going to integrative doctors or functional medicine practitioners. I feel they're, they are the ones that have a, a, a less compartmentalized narrow approach to healthcare where they're taking in the whole picture. Um, they're looking at labs, but they're using that as, as a guide based on your symptoms as well. So, you know, Georgie, it's difficult. <laughs> it's extremely difficult because we're, we are taught to rely on the, the doctor's knowledge, and, but sometimes their knowledge is a little short-sighted or maybe outdated. You know, and I give huge kudos to a lot of these doctors that I've been interviewing because they've said over and over again that gone are the days of Dr. Knows Best. And what they had said is we really need to be viewing our clinicians, regardless of the type, allopathic, naturopath, and acupuncturist, they're consultants and patients are really beginning to understand this. And yes, you know, there may be egos, but quite honestly, you know, any human is going to have an ego regardless of whether or not you're a doctor. But I think, you know, as patients, we just need to think about how we position the questions that we ask, but also know that, you know, if there is a challenge, you know, the doctors that I've been speaking to said that, you know, sometimes if a doctor snaps or gets frustrated um, or may not answer the question properly, it's maybe that they just don't know how to deal with it. I mean, remember, they're, they're human as well. And so for any of you who ever feel dismissed, um, you know, actually I just did an Instagram story recently and I asked people to rate on a scale of one to 10, um, how they felt at their doctor's offices and believe it or not, you know, between 8.5 and 10 was the score for how dismissed that they often felt in the doctor's offices. And so the message for that is I'm not at all trying to say, you know, oh, the medical system is horrible. Well, I mean, it is definitely challenging. But the real message um, I'm trying to get at is, you know, you're not alone. Uh, there's a really tough system. It's not a person. It's the system. It's how, you know, insurance companies are funding things. It's how doctors are reimbursed. It's how people are trained. And I could go on and on. Um, so, yes, it is very complicated. And unfortunately, it's the patient who suffers, which is why it's so great to see people like you and others who are doing so much to, to provide the necessary information to the patient. Yeah. And so even with our audience um, on thyroid change too, patients ask this all the time. I can't afford an integrative doctor because my insurance doesn't cover it. Uh, a lot of insurances won't cover the, the length of time you spend with an integrative doctor. You know, what can they do then? They have, maybe they're in a small town somewhere in, you know, and they're not, they don't have access or they can't drive to another place where there are different options for practitioners. What can they do? How can they work with the doctor that they do have? So on our website, we have the list of what we consider from based on other integrative doctors we've spoken to the top labs for screening for a thyroid condition, as well as other labs that play a role in thyroid production and thyroid conversion too. 
and we tell them, you know, there's a printable PDF there, print that out, take it to your doctor because we have cited sources on there. We have the research that backs it up <laughs> that says, you know, this is why we, we need these tests. So it's all backed up there on, on the website. So they can absolutely print out that information and take it to their doctor and say, here's the research. <laughs> Oh, perfect. I'll add that link into the show notes and even on my website where I do have a page about thyroid disease that summarizes some of the key points and resources that people can go to. Okay, so we've gotten the diagnosis. We've gotten the lab results. um, We've gotten past being able to make sure that the lab results were done right. Um, But now it's all about the, the thyroid condition and what you have because it's not just a thyroid condition. There are specific ones. So the main ones that I know of are Hashimoto's and Graves disease, but there's others as well. So maybe you can talk a bit about that. Well, the top four ones are um, Hashimoto's and Graves disease, with our, which are both autoimmune conditions that affect the thyroid gland. Um, one creates hypothyroid symptoms and one creates hyperthyroid symptoms. Hashimoto's creating hypo and Graves creating hyper. And then there's the people that feel like they swing back and forth because of this autoimmune condition. And then there's straight up hypothyroidism and hyperthyroidism that's not related to an autoimmune. But what they're finding is that they believe, <laughs> they believe most of um, even straight up hyper or hypothyroidism that it is related to an autoimmune condition, whether it's expressing itself in the, the lab results or not. Got it. Right. And then there's things like thyroid eye disease. Um, you know, we have thyroid storms and things like that. But the top four, the most, most common are the ones that I just explained. So the other theme I'm seeing is not only is it hard to get diagnosed, but then it's the symptoms. So, I, you know, I certainly don't want people to be afraid or concerned, but I do think it's important to be realistic. So this is not as simple as I go to my doctor I get tests, I've been diagnosed, and this is wonderful, here's my medication or my diet plan, all of the above, whatever's needed, and now everything's going to be great, I'm symptom-free, I'm healed. It's a little bit more complicated and way less straightforward. So um, I thought it would be helpful if you could share, you know, for those who are, you know, getting diagnosed, what should they be aware of so that they feel empowered and not frustrated because, you know, I don't want people to feel like, oh, there's never going to be an end to this. I'm never going to feel better or whatnot. Um, so what should people be prepared for? If they're continuing to have symptoms, I would like them to know that taking that one pill doesn't mean that that's curing all of their thyroid problems. Um, they could be underdosed. They can be overdosed. They could be not be converting the medication properly. So my advice would just be keep searching and keep looking out there. Go to the Thyroid Change website. We have a whole page on why certain medications may not be working for you, and this is why. But it really goes back to the lab interpretation. So if a good doctor is giving a patient, so for example, T4 medication, otherwise known as Synthroid or Levothyroxine, yep. is, has been known as the gold standard for hypothyroid patients. A lot of patients don't convert the T4 to T3, which is necessary. The T3 is what's needed in every cell of the body. So if you're a bad converter, all the T4 in the world is really not going to help you a lot if you're not converting it, though. So, and there's another medication, T3, liothyronine, but they've been reluctant to prescribe it because overprescribing it, it can cause heart racing, it could lead to some heart issues, and it's short acting. Typically, it has been short acting, you know, or only for six hours, so you have to dose it a couple times a day. So, but if a patient is only given T4 medication, a good doctor would look at the labs and see that, and see that, like, okay, well, you're, we're giving you T4, it's not converting to T3, or your T3, T3 isn't high enough, it's not getting into the cellular level, we need to start adding some T3 to this too to make up for it. And that's where they're falling short. They're not looking at the labs um, in detail to understand what's happening in that process. Now let's talk about iodine. I recall reading in Dr. Lara Bryden's book, The Period Repair Manual, where she talks about thyroid and iodine. So apparently um, some do need iodine supplementation, but specifically the supplements themselves. Um, She spoke so much about how to be careful with the dosing and how you need to be extremely closely monitored 
but that there's also controversy over what the right dose is. So can you expand on that for us, please? Iodine is tricky, right? We do know that iodine is needed to produce thyroid hormone. It's important for the production and uh, for conversion as well. What is tricky uh, is that there have been reports of patients with autoimmune thyroid conditions that have flares with iodine. So even just recently, Dr. Weston Childs, um, who he's a thyroid practitioner who posts and writes articles specifically on thyroid conditions. It just a couple of weeks ago, I saw an article by him um, and he was still on the fence a little bit about iodine where you need, just need to be careful with it. So yes, it's important, the right supplementation and having that right balance is also super important too. Okay. So yeah, th th there is still a lot of controversy about it. Thank you. No, I just didn't want to leave the iodine discussion off the table because I've read so much about how if it's not dosed properly, it can create a lot of issues. So thank you. You know, I, I personally would, wouldn't take iodine without practitioner's guidance at all. You know, it's a supplement that's available to everyone, but it's one of those tricky ones. So yeah, definitely work with a qualified and a savvy practitioner who knows a lot about it. And you know, you've been talking about your website. So I, I uh, wanted to call out attention that not only is there your organization, Thyroid Change, but also the American Thyroid Association. And I guess they're more the equivalent of ACOG, which is for um, obstetricians and gynecologists. And because this one, all the members are doctors. And quite honestly, what I have found, especially when it comes to women's health and the delicacy around it and complexity is having you know, multiple perspectives, you know, the patient perspective, a functional medicine perspective, allopathic perspective. And so I was really struck by the American Thyroid Association and the fact that it was all MDs that were involved. And I'm not saying it's necessarily a bad thing. I just think it's important for people to understand as they're researching information about thyroid disease and just as they're evaluating the information, given that we're learning more and more and there's still some disagreement around testing, et cetera, to just be aware that as you're researching it, understand where all the perspectives are coming from so that you can um, have an informed opinion and obviously making sure that there's data to support the things that you're reading as well. Yeah, and part of our mission was trying to work with the ATA. Um, it fell on deaf ears for, for, for many years. Um, and then um, we noticed they were starting to incorporate some of the challenges we've been facing as patients into their conferences. So I, I do agree with Dr. Holtorf when he says that the, the, the guidelines are, are, are behind. And why that is, I, I'm not sure. Um, perhaps there's not enough research we have some research, but maybe it's not enough for them to make the changes. But yeah, I mean, recently, I mean, for the longest time, they said natural desiccated thyroid med medication, uh, it was unstable or not reliable. But then recently, they're starting to say that, oh, there was a study done that, that patients actually preferred natural desiccated thyroid. So I think they're, I think they're coming around. Right. <laughs> I'll well, just say that. No, it's great to hear that um, the ATA is coming around and adding in different viewpoints. You know, I, I, I've also, you know, in my observations and talking to so many people and doing a lot of my research is understanding how, you know, the different functions are, are trained or the different types of clinicians. So the allopathic or traditional doctors, it's very much around clinical trials and what the results of those are that drive a lot of their decision making. Then there's you know, naturopathic doctors and, and acupuncturists, and they have a different way of assessing the patient. And I think it's important for consumers to understand how the training impacts the decision making. And all of them come from a different perspective. And I think all put together is really where the best healthcare comes into play. You know, but this also makes it really challenging for the, the consumer and why it's important for organizations like yours, um, as well as patients really standing up and asking the right questions. And so I really appreciate you doing what you're doing with uh, thyroid change because I think you've done an incredible job and, you know, we need it. All of us need it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thanks for having me on here and speaking with me about it. I, I hope and I, and I, I really do think that um, 
advocacy and education and podcasts like this are the key to getting people thinking about, oh, well, maybe I might have a thyroid condition. Maybe I need to ask about this. Maybe I need to fire my doctor <laughs> and look for a new one. Well, it's all on the table, right? And that wraps up another empowering session here at the FemPower Health Podcast. Now, before you dash off, I've got a quick, exciting invitation for you. Please join our vibrant community by subscribing to our weekly newsletter, because it's really your frontline update on groundbreaking women's health research, the latest health-enhancing products, fun quizzes to boost your health IQ, and unique discoveries that you won't want to miss. All of this delivered straight to your inbox, cutting through the noise of social media algorithms. Love today's insights? Show your support by rating and reviewing our podcast. Your feedback is more than just a pat on our backs here at FemPower Health. It lights the way for others seeking guidance and community in their health journey, amplifying the voices that need to be heard. And for a deeper dive into today's topics, check out the show notes and explore our website at fempower-health.com. Our site is a treasure trove of knowledge, neatly categorized by topics of interest and life stage ensuring you find exactly what you need to empower your health journey. And your voice matters to us deeply. Whether you have a question, a story to share, or feedback on our episodes, reach out directly at info at fempower-health.com. Drop us a message on social media or hit reply on any newsletter. Your insights inspire our conversations. And a quick note, the knowledge we share is here to embolden you in discussions with your healthcare provider. It's not medical advice. Always consult with your doctor for health decisions. And remember, the diverse perspectives of our guests reflect their individual journeys, and it's not an endorsement by FemPower Health. Here's to empowering your health journey one episode at a time, and I'll see you on the next FemPower Health podcast episode.